Right. On Blue Light, you remember, you remember MDPB 10, yes? And I had more hiding places around that property and on San Pedro than you could possibly imagine. The, the press is notoriously inaccurate. Uh, our first product is a product called D-Central. I used to sell drugs because if you take enough drugs, the only way you can support your habit is to sell to others. If you, if you are a marijuana smoker, I would vastly prefer you switch to heroin. Portland is great. The, uh, the motto of the city is keep Portland weird and I'm doing my, my part. That's a big goof back. Yeah, please do that. Please do that. I thought about it and I think we should just cut to the sex guns and drugs. What do you think? <laughs> That's fine with me, whatever people want to hear. All right. I, I, I've dreamed of retiring since I was 16. Um, but uh, retiring is, is nearly impossible for me. I, I, I enjoy fishing and snorkeling. I don't, that's what I want to do with my life. But I moved to Belize, and the first day I'm snorkeling out by the reef, I'm thinking about, you know, we need a boat system up here. There's this group, and many of you here may even be on it, called Blue Light. If there are some drug aficionados in the room, raise your hands if you know Blue Light. One. Uh, and a lady at that. All right, marvelous. So, well, blue light is the is the the number one drug form on the planet, and it's composed of, of very intelligent, well-educated people. Many of them chemists. Others are doctors and psychiatrists. And, and, and they have this incredible attitude that we should all be taking drugs. Well, I don't think you want to take drugs. Um, and I had a bet with a friend. What I did is I created, okay, there, there was this drug. If, if, on blue light, you remember, you remember MDPB-10, yes? Sure, the mythical drug that did everything. It made you a sexual god, it made you live forever, it gave you energy that you could go for 50 weeks without sleeping and you gained weight. And it was just marvelous stuff. Uh, but it was, it was fake, it was just a ruse created by a couple of British gentlemen. Um, but no one really believed that it was a ruse, and, and for years, and this is about 12 years ago, that this mythical drug rose, rose up. So I went online, and as a, uh, as a member called Stuffmonger, I didn't give my name, uh, I gave the formula for recreating MDPV-10 and invited everybody to recreate it themselves. And for three months, these, these highly intelligent people were, were, were dicking around with, with stove ovens and baking soda and kitchen utensils, doing absolutely nothing. And I, I just had the laugh of my life. Uh, I was naked, carrying a gun. I saw what was happening. I put my gun down. It was thrown up against the wall, handcuffed, uh, made to sit. I, they let me put some pants on, by the way, to have a politeness to the women in the crowd. Um, there's no fun to look at a naked 68-year-old man, I can promise you. So, um, it got me handcuffed in the sun for 14 hours, kneeling with my hands behind my back. A very painful thing. I do not recommend it for anyone, even those who are at the heavy S&M amongst you. It's not fun. So, um, uh, and then left without, without any charges. Why? Uh, two weeks earlier, the local politician, by the way, I, I, I lived on the island of San Pedro, which is a marvelous place. All the tourists go there, it's just like America. Speak English, everybody's white. I moved to the interior, the only white man in a town of 10,000 people. Uh, and I moved into the backyard of the most powerful man in Belize. Um, after I'd been there for a year, a representative came and said, why don't you donate $2 million to my patron's campaign, and in return, we'll give you all this land, and benefits, and so on, and I said, uh, no. Uh, they raided my property two weeks later, came back two weeks after that and said, have you changed your mind? And I said, yes, I'm pissed off now. And so I went to the international press, and that was in, in May of 2012, and for eight months I ran an ongoing war with the Belgian government, demanding an apology at the very least, and, and getting the attention of the world government on the corruption and, and all the nightmares that was, were happening. Uh, I should have listened to my, my compatriot Americans and say, stay in San Pedro, fish, surf, and snorkel. Uh, I did not. And then there was the neighbor. The death of my neighbor, Mr. Fall, who I barely knew. That was a convenient thing for the, by, by the way, there, uh, not to make light of Mr. Fall's death, it is, one, Belize is one of the most dangerous countries in the world and is called the murder capital of the world by many organizations because the per capita death rate is the highest of any country in the world. Um, I barely knew Mr. Fall. It was a convenient thing for the Belizean government to try to pick me up for questioning because in Belize, you may hold someone for questioning for 60 days with no charges, 
and you may renew that indefinitely. So I could have been 60 years waiting to be questioned. I chose not to go that route, and I went on the route. Why didn't you try to get a U.S. attorney or someone to help you out? Well, you're, you're, you're assuming that the legal system in the, other, in the rest of the world is much like here in the States, where a court order has bite. Now, let me give you an example. The telephone company in Belize was nationalized three years ago by the Belizean government. It was the, the, the company had been owned by a gentleman named Lord Ashcroft. Lord Ashcroft went to court. The appeals court said, hey, give it back. The prime minister, instead of giving it back, sent the army into the, the telephone headquarters and prevented the employees from coming back. There's no law there. I mean, why hire a lawyer? Why pay the lawyer to, to end up saying, gee, I can't do anything for you? You know, you, you suffer your losses in life. You know, you take what comes and move on. That's what I did. So you already had the attention of the international press. You decided to run. Um, tell me about that. What was the, did you have a idea of what you were going to do? Did you have a plan or did you just kind of move out? Well, I just, I just moved out. I mean, I, 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 I left. I was planning to leave alone. And one of the women I was living with said, you're not going without me. Uh, and that was Sam. That was Samantha, a vicious little girl. And so, you know, rather than have Sam and the army after me, I took her with me. Um, it, was, it was a wise choice. I felt my life was in danger, and I'm, I'm convinced it was. Uh, I had every single day written notices to some press somewhere. I had started a blog, uh, and it had devastated the, the tourist industry in Belize. Tourism accounted for 70% of the Belizean gross national product. It dropped by 50% after I started my blog. They just wanted me out of the way. Mm. So um, call that paranoid, call it not, I don't, I don't care. It's what, it's what was actually happening. Um, the, um, uh, okay, the, 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 the diversion tactic. All of the borders had, I was the number one, every single army officer and soldier and every policeman in the country had my photograph. Uh, and there was a bounty. And they had, they had blocked all of the borders. However, the Belizeans, you know, are just are just very strange people. They tend to hire, for example, a, a, a policeman gets forty-two dollars a month U.S. Now, from that, he's got to feed his family, or send his children to school, uh, pay his rent, and so on. It is not much money. So, not the smartest people take those jobs. The net result of all of that, from a U.S. point of view, from a press point of view, from what people were reading in the newspapers and seeing on TV, was. John has gone off the deep end. John is doing all these deceptive things. John has all these girlfriends. John's been dabbling in drugs. We don't know who this guy is anymore. Do you feel, do you sort of feel bad about how much your persona changed that, through that experience? Well, that was my persona as viewed through the press and, and as those who read the press and believe it. Uh, the, the press is notoriously inaccurate. Now, that, may I do a demonstration for you? We, we, uh, need, well, may I ask for honesty from you folks for just two minutes? I'd like to see a, a, a raising of hands for those of you who have at any time in your life been divorced. Now, leave your hands up for just a moment. Okay. Now, of those of you who have been divorced, at any time were you unfaithful to your ex-wife or husband? Leave your hand up if it was. Six, seven, eight. Anybody else? Did some of you put your hands down after you kept them up? <laughs> okay. Well, at least eight people. Well, that's that's a pretty fair thing. Let me ask another question. How many of you people are currently married? Raising hands. How many of you have actually been unfaithful to your current husband or wife? <laughs> Nobody. <laughs> Nobody. Do you see the statistical impossibility of these two samples? <laughs> now. Okay, what is the difference? One is, I'm asking you about something that's current, something happening today. Now, what happened five years ago? You got your hand up, you're hoping the camera will go on, you go, yeah, bitch, see? You know? But now, no, you want to cry my wife, please do not put the camera on me, and my hand never went up. Here's the point I'm trying to make. The press is consistently concerned with what's happening now, it is human nature. If you work downtown and there was a robbery next door to your work, and a policeman happens by and says, where were you today? You're gonna to try to find some reason to explain why you could not have done this. This is just human nature. And so the press is now saying, 
What about now and here? And trying to find truth. Well, good luck. So what it says is no interest in. I'd never heard of a computer virus, and up to that point, I think neither had anyone else, not even conceived of one. I was reading it thinking, what the heck is this? And then it came to me, oh, I know what they did. They, 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 they I got some code that really replicates itself. Cool. And as soon as I got that, I got, you know what, that's easy to fix. Cool. And I wrote a little program, and that was the beginning of McAfee. At some point, all of that money sort of dwindled. Yeah by press reports. There's one estimate that said that at your lowest point, your net worth was down to about $4 million. That may have been due to the recession and so forth. Is that, is that accurate? Again, I, I really have no clue. Now, people ask me how much money I have. If someone wandered up to you in the street and said, how much money do you have? Or what are you worth? Would you be thrilled or offended? Or what would you feel? You know, most people would be offended. And, and I'm like most people. Excuse me, I'm looking at um, I, I'm very much like most people, and, and really, it, it's nobody's business. Mm -hmm. So the numbers that I throw out are numbers that I just randomly feel like throwing out. If the number four looks good today, I'll say I'm worth four million. Yeah. <laughs> if uh, four, the number 44 was the, the, the first two numbers of the, the lottery winner yesterday, I'll say, well, 44 million. Yeah. <laughs> it's meaningless. Leave nothing I say when it comes to my work. You know. It is no one's business but mine. And so while you were, I think in Guatemala even, there were a couple of different um, people trying to get uh, you to sign contracts for doing movies and so forth. You bet. Where does that stand now? Um, well, you see, Warner, Warner Brothers just announced they had hired the screenwriters for, for their movie on my life. And I think that's based on Josh Davis's book, not one of my favorite people. Josh has done nothing but write about me for years, and it's sort of tragic in my mind. But in any case, uh, the other one is uh, by Future Impact Media in Montreal, Canada. Um, their, screen, their screenplay is already finished, and I think it's a, a really spectacular project. Uh, that will be coming out in about a year. There's also a feature-length documentary that the BBC is doing, which unfortunately I had to sit still for for about uh, 14 days to, you know, while they interviewed me. And um, that's all over here. And that should be coming out in, in March of next year. Okay. And the one in Montreal, you're actually participating in? I, I'm, I'm helping them, because they're nice people. Okay. <laughs> the French Canadians, are, they're real people. I like that. Warner Brothers, I won't even talk to. Back in technology, which I really can't seem to escape, a company called Future Tense. Uh, our first product is a product called D Central. I think we have, uh, did Francois put our website together? I'm not sure. We have a, we have a, a website which, which doesn't say much, it's a sort of little teaser. Um, called, I think, futuretenscentral.com. Um, but, but the product, you know, I've, I've been thinking about this product for years. I, I, can't, I can't get out of security, and I've, uh, for some reason it, it's, it's part of my brain, part of my thinking. Um, and we don't have much anymore. I mean, certainly not in the online world. Uh, the NSA uh, helped create every single encryption algorithm that we use and therefore can get access to whatever they want. I'm 68 years old and if, if you can just give me um, you know, any, any small amount of information about yourself, I promise you within three days I can turn on the camera on your computer at home and watch you do whatever you're doing, provided you're still connected to the net. Well, if I can do it, any idiot can do it. We live in a very insecure world with a very insecure communication platform. You can create a private network so that you and all of your close friends that live in your local area can communicate and they know who you are. It also has a public aspect, in which case you drop all the files and information in there that you as a good citizen might wish to share with anybody. I don't know, the latest MP3 that you have, which you really like and you would like to share. A uh, picture of some, some girl you think is cute, we don't really care what. You drop it in that public area. Now, we have it, it has no screen, it's just a little round little thing that drops wherever you want it, and it communicates with your iPhone, with your Android, with your, uh, with your tablet, with your laptop, we don't care which, we have apps for each of these. And um, in the morning you wake up and you open your app and say, you know, I'm really interested in hearing the latest thing from whatever, techno music or rap or whatever you have an interest in, and you list off the, the things you might like, and, and you forget about it. You go outside, and the device is localized. It has a range of about three blocks in the city and a quarter of a mile in the country. And so everyone within three blocks is communicating with everyone else within three blocks. 
But keep in mind, everybody's in a different location, so everybody's local network is completely unique to themselves. And it changes as you move, or as people move in and out of your local area. Now, so you've asked for a specific file. If you're on a college campus, you're, you'll probably get responses within you know, a quarter of a second. Um, if you're you know, out on the road somewhere in a very you know, sparse area, it may take you minutes or hours to get a response. But you don't even know who is responding. You're walking by, the devices are communicating with one another, and one of them says, oh, you've, you've got, you want that file, well, here it is. It doesn't even ask who you are. It doesn't know who you are. There is no unique identifier to your device that is constant. Every few minutes, it changes its identification. It is impossible to even know where it came from or who it went to. When you're on your private network, there's a name attached or an ID. But even then, everything is encrypted as for the public network. Since the networks are invisible to each other and in constant flux, there is simply no way to tell who is doing what, when, or where. We have, it's, and this is the very, the very basic level. We of course have other levels. We do have nodes, and every city there will be three or four nodes that will connect to the internet. But the internet, let's say, you're, you're communicating with someone in Denver, the only visible part will be the encrypted communication between San Jose and Denver. When it reaches Denver, it goes into the void again. I would say we are six months out from our first prototype. Okay. And we actually have a countdown, I think, on our website. Do we not? Yes. So apparently we do have a schedule. Um, I believe that everyone will eventually want one. Anybody who's concerned about privacy, anyone's concerned about security. So the NSA will not get into it. The, the encryption that we have developed is unique, and the NSA or nor any other governmental agency has been involved. So this is essentially a, a, a dark web, right? A, a localized dark web. Do you but, have... But, but, it, but it connects up by relays to every other localized dark web that, 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 that has one of our devices. We made a mistake at the beginning of this whole thing. We should have encrypted everything. We should have encrypted hard drives. We should have encrypted email from the start. Is this somehow a, a solution to where we are today? Well, or, what we should have done can never be a solution to where we are today. He's absolutely correct. We should have, but we did not. So therefore, I am doing. Imagine how impossible it would be to escape if enough people, teenagers, can get out, get out, catch this guy last night. Um, you, how, how do you possibly escape? At, at every movement, for five blocks around you, everybody's looking for you. People are looking out windows to see you dodge into this building, went into this building. Cool, we're all now watching on all around it. And this is just this is one of my favorite things, because I want to sign up for it myself. I can't sleep at night sometimes. So um, there, there are thousands of applications for this. This is coming, and it cannot be stopped. Do you have any thoughts more broadly on the how this, well, let's just call it the nascent police state, how it's going to play out here in the US? Well, you know, I hope it does not play out like every other nascent police state, which is, which is lack a total lack of freedom for all of the citizens. Um, let's hope it doesn't reach that point. You know, I would say that, that, that psychedelics have, have been extraordinarily influential in my life and extraordinarily horrific at the same time. Um, you know, I would not advise anyone to drop drugs. And, and Steve Jobs is one of the fortunate few uh, where, where acid did, in fact, end up being positive for him. But for every one of those, there are probably 10 that still think they're Jesus. Uh, and this is the problem with psychedelics. What's your opinion on marijuana? Okay. Uh, well, should I even, should I tell the truth on this? <laughs> All right. I used to I used to, I used to I used to sell drugs because if you take enough drugs, the only way you can support your habit is to sell to others. So, um, and and for many years I did. Uh, I, by the way, I stopped using all drugs, selling drugs, or accessing drugs uh, a little over 30 years ago. So this is not a recent part of my history. However, I did notice that among my clients, I liked the pot users the most because their lives never went anywhere. They remain customers forever. And I hate to, I hate to burst your bubble, but I'll be frank with you now. If you, if you are a marijuana smoker, I would vastly prefer you switch to heroin. And here's why. Heroin will take you down faster, and you can then pick yourself up and start your life. Because marijuana is the drug of illusion. 
It creates the illusion that you are thinking great thoughts and doing great things while you are sitting on the sofa growing a beard. <laughs> are you getting paid today? I'm sorry? Are you getting paid today? Well, absolutely not. You know, I can't get paid to do anything. <laughs> I'm sorry? How do you like Portland? Portland is great. The, uh, the motto of the city is keep Portland weird, and I'm doing my, my part. <laughs> Well, I, I have one legitimate child. What's your favorite drug? I don't do drugs anymore. What was your favorite drug? Well, that's a really tricky one. See, I, 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 I was more like a, a chemist with drugs. You know, I, I, I had to mix things around. But if I just were to choose one drug, I would, I would say mushrooms. Psilocybin is probably as good as it gets. Did you create any amazing things for us? I, mean, I, I don't think I want to promote use of drugs by saying mix this with that and you'll have a magical time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Will you go back to Belize? Yes. You know, not no time soon, sir. <laughs> I'm sorry. But, but see, uh, there is no situation to rectify. Really, I'm not charged with anything. And every reporter who has gone to the Belizean police and asked questions, police say, no, we have no evidence linking him to the crime. We really want to talk to him. So why not go back? Because talking to me involves putting me in jail for 60 days minimum, and which is, which is they, can, they can continue that forever. It is a renewable 60 days. There is no law in the country, sir. Nothing to rectify. Very good. Well, thank you very much. This has been a great session. Thank you, John.